Hello everybody, my name is Michael Wagner. I teach at the Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University in Philadelphia and my specialties are digital media theory, game design and immersive media, in particular immersive audio. Uh, in this video I would like to address one comment that was made most often as a result of my Ambisonics videos and that was, why didn't you use Reaper? Uh, things are so complicated in, in, in Ableton, why don't we use Reaper? And that's actually a very good question. Now at the same time I also have to say that and anybody who is in the industry or kind of works with audio has came across that that particular kind of issue that uh, the Reaper community tends to be a little bit almost like a cult. There's uh, whenever you have a, a, a technical question, the, uh, the first answer will always be uh, just use Reaper. Uh, and that's interesting, but it's also true to some extent. So, so today what I would like to do is I would like to simply show how simple it is to set that up in Reaper. At the end of the video, I'm also going to address why I used Ableton or why somebody would like to use a different DAW, even though it is much more complicated to set that up. But if you're new to Ambisonics and you want to get started, then uh, then most certainly Reaper is an excellent option to, to get to get going. Also a relatively cheap option to get things going. So it's, it's actually very inexpensive. Uh, all things considered. Uh, now before we get started, and this video is probably not going to take a whole lot of time because once again things are relatively simple in Reaper, uh, but before we, we get things started I'd like to just kind of address a couple of pieces of software that you need. Um, so first of all obviously you need Reaper. Um, now if you have if never came across Reaper, Reaper is really what I would call a no-nonsense DAW. If there's anything you want to do, uh, you can do that in Reaper. It's not going to look particularly pretty from a user experience perspective, but uh, it gets the job done. So it, it is actually a fairly excellent tool. Uh, and the, the, the second thing that you need is because Reaper by itself doesn't really have any um, tools that would allow us to work with Ambisonics or convert things into Ambisonics, you need a plugin suite that uh, can take a stereo signal and turn it into an Ambisonics signal. Um, now there are a couple of different options out there and that's actually one of the things that is highly interesting that uh, you know kind of the, the plugins that you get for turning stereo um, audio into Ambisonics audio only comes in two different flavors. It's, it's either open source and free or it is extremely expensive. Uh, and the reason for that is primarily that uh, the people who work in that field come from two different disciplines. And the first discipline is sort of from an academic perspective. So there are many universities or researchers that work with that type of, of audio format. And they, especially when they have funded research, uh, quite often want to disseminate their, their results in an easily accessible way. So what they usually do is they provide an open source version of the software suite, which is then picked up and, and continues to be developed by, by entire open source groups or you are on the professional end of things where, pe where people really rely on excellent customer support, technical support, where things are done in a way that I can completely rely on the software and that is usually very, very expensive. Now, there are, there are a number of different options out there. I'm just going to show you four that I found particularly interesting. The first one and probably the, and, and I'm going to place the links to this uh, in the description. So if you if you uh, have never heard about these things, uh, just follow the links below. Now the most the most often used software suite uh, is uh, probably the IEM plugin suite. It came out of, an, of a European research project. Uh, the interesting thing about that plugin suite is not only is it free, but it's also seventh order. Uh, so it's probably also the most complete package that you can get. Now a similar package is the Sparta package, also coming out of an European research project, also 7th order Ambisonics. I have to say this is the one that I used least, so I am not completely familiar with all the functionalities of this plugin suite, but I, I, um, I did use it once and I found it to be equally interesting as the IAM suite. So, so I, this is probably a, a little bit of a preference uh, depending on what type of functionality you want you want or or, or essentially how you you want it to look uh, it's 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 it is it there is not a huge difference between those two plugin suites so just check them out and uh, and pick whatever you find is more appropriate um, which brings us to the more uh, to the commercial versions uh, a commercial version that i used a bit uh, is uh, are the ssa plugins a uh, very nice developer, I, I uh, communicated with him a couple of times, very responsive. Um, uh, from what I'm understanding, this is a one person thing um, coming out of, of, out of the UK. Uh, also seventh order, 
um, slightly expensive, but you know, kind of very, very well done. Uh, so I like those actually uh, a lot. And the final one, which is probably the most professional solution, uh, is uh, the suit from Blue Lippel Sound. Now, that uh, has two things that are slightly different. The first one is that it only goes up to third order. So you're, you're not going to get the uh, additional orders from fourth to seventh order. Which which might be a disadvantage, although quite honestly, in a commercial environment, uh, we rarely go up higher than than third order. It's only when you're doing uh, you know kind of research work or anything that's really more experimental that you need to go up to higher orders. Um, in a commercial environment, third order is perfectly fine. Um, but what makes this uh, plugin is really interesting is the, the quality of the decoders. It comes with a number of decoders, or it actually doesn't come with a number of decoders. You can buy a, a couple of decoders that are really, really excellent. So, for example, if you want to set up uh, a particular um, monitoring environment using spe a speaker system, so let's say you have a Dolby Atmos speaker system and you want to turn it into an ambisonics monitoring system, then uh, Blue Ripple Sound has an excellent decoder that, that, that does an, an outstanding job in turning the ambisonic signal into an into a Dolby Atmos signal that you can then monitor on your Dolby Atmos uh, in, in your Dolby Atmos environment and even more so they have a software that allows you to take any speaker setup that you have so for, for, for example one of the things that you can do and we actually did that at, at our university at some point you can pick up a number of very very cheap uh, speakers active speakers and, and just distribute them in some way in your room and then you have uh, you can take the ripple sound software uh, and calculate a decoder run or de run a sort of an algorithm that will result in a decoder that you can use so that you can monitor your ambisonics uh, in that particular speaker setup that you're setting up and that that works extremely well so that's one of the things that that this company or blue ripple sound is is particularly known for it's not particularly inexpensive so you have to you have to be aware of that but it is really 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 good and the final thing that we need, obviously, is the NX uh, monitoring system. Now, for most of these, you technically don't really need it. So you could use the built-in uh, decoder. Um, all of these um, solutions come with a decoder that turns the ambisonic signal back into a stereo or binaural signal. Um, but uh, if you want to get an immersive experience, uh, you need a um, head um, solution that can track your head. And for that, the NX system is still the best. There are a couple of, uh, of solutions out there that use very cheap um, tracking devices or tra tracking sensors that you can pick up um, on, on something like Amazon or AliExpress. Um, uh, that are a little bit more do-it-yourself. Those can be really ex inexpensive, but they don't really work as well, I found at least, as the as the uh, NX system. And the NX system is not particularly expensive either. So those are the things that we need. So let me get directly into Reaper. So I already opened up a, an instance of Reaper. And... Uh, and uh, the nice thing about Reaper and Ambisonics is that we don't really have to leave Reaper. So we, everything that we're going to do is going to be within Reaper. There's nothing that we need to add, not, no cables we need to connect, um, no additional software we need to run. Everything runs within Reaper. So let's get started. So um, I'm going to just do a very, very simple setup. And for that, uh, all I'm going to do right now is I'm going to add a new instrument track. Uh, and let's use a monophonic, let's use Basil, which is, which is nice. And actually, let me use my headphones. Um, so this is just the, the basic sound. We actually don't need much more than that right now. Now this is a stereo track or a stereo, um, yeah, stereo track. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to turn that into an ambisonics track, and uh, and Reaper is capable of handling up 
to 64 channels, which essentially means that we can use Ambisonics up to order seven. This, by the way, is also the reason why you get the software packages with seventh order, because that's essentially what Reaper can handle. So even though we uh, the Waves plugin can only handle first order Ambisonics, why not use seventh order? So let's do that. Um, so the, the, the thing that we need to do is we need to turn the channel or the, the track actually into uh, a 64 channel track. So we're going into the um, uh, out, uh, the, the, the routing options. And in the routing options, we can um, specify the number of track channels. And what we want to do is we want to have 64 of those. Now it's going to immediately come up with a different mixer. Now obviously, currently we're only playing in the first two channels. The other 62 channels are empty, but that's going to change in a second. So the second thing we need to do is the master track or the master, the master track is essentially also currently only a stereo channel uh, track. So we need to turn that into an ambisonics track as well. So we also need to change the number of channels on the master. And in the very similar way, track channels set that up to 64. And uh, still nothing has changed because we are just monitoring the first two channels, right? Uh, so even though there are 64 of those in the, in the, on the master, uh, only the first two actually going through my uh, audio interface. So, um, so let's get started with doing some panning. Um, so what we need to do is we need to add a, um, a panner to our, to our instrument track. And... Uh, the one we are going to use is the IAM. Let me just find that here quickly. Where is it? Uh, IEM and uh, the stereo encoder. And they come with a with a number of different plugins, uh, uh, ranging from you know compressors, uh, reverbs, all kinds of things, uh, and uh, EQs, obviously. Um, but we are not going to use all of them. We are, we are just going to use the stereo encoder. The stereo encoder, what it does is it takes a stereo signal and turns it into an ambisonic signal. It's a, four, a 64 channel plugin. And uh, it looks similar to what we had in the Ambisonics for Life. So in the Envelope for Life system, it's just uh, essentially a panner where you can pan between the um, front, back, up, down, and, and the three dimensions. So if we now play, if you remember, essentially I now have the panda on there. What, so what it's currently doing is I have a mono signal uh, and that mono signal is going to be converted into, a, um, into an ambisonics. And because of the way this signal is set up only, uh, I'm only hearing uh, something in the mono channel, which in the ambisonics is the left channel, right? So, so that's essentially what I'm seeing. And you already see that, that down here, uh, there's already a lot going on on the 64 channels because the different uh, orders or the, the channels on the different orders in the ambisonic signal, some of them have a, have a signal, some of them don't. And, uh, and, and that, that is passed on. So if we, if we move that around, currently nothing much is happening because essentially I don't have a decoder yet. So after, after putting on the, the encoder on the uh, instrument track, we need to put the decoder on the master track. And, uh, and for the decoder, once again, we could use the IEM decoder, but that would not allow us to track our head. So, so what we want to do is we want to use the, the Waves NX. Uh, so let's just search for NX and... There is the ambisonics. It, once again, it doesn't really make any difference which one you choose. Going to choose uh, the uh, four channel in, two channel out version. Now what's going to happen now, uh, and we did that with the uh, ambisonics for life um, tutorial, it's going to open up the uh, ambisonics. So let me, oops, here we are. Let me just close that, sorry. Uh, so it's going to open up the I want this in the front. Uh, it's going to open up the um, the plugin, which is the the decoder, and it's going to open up the head tracker. So the next thing we need to do is we need to connect the head tracker. I already put that on the uh, on my headphones, and we need to connect that with the NX head tracking system. So I'm turning that on. So there's a light here that essentially starts blinking blue, which means that this, the device is now turned on. 
And then uh, we need to connect it with the um, head tracking system. Now, uh, I already said that in the last video that uh, on a Windows system that can be a little bit finicky. Now on a Mac, you will immediately see the head tracker popping up. Popping up. And by the way, if you are on a Mac, uh, it works exactly the same. So, so this, this, what we are doing today with Reaper and Ambisonics is completely identical on a Mac at, uh, and, and on the Windows system. So we most likely need to connect the um, uh, da, 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 da. We most likely need to connect the Bluetooth device. So add a device, Bluetooth. So the NX tracker, it does not automatically pair. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I have not yet figured out when exactly it does. Well, it started to pair. No, it doesn't. Okay, so connecting. Okay. Uh, and once again, that can be a little finicky. I found that I sometimes need to go back and, and kind of click on the done thing here and then it will pop up. Okay, so here, we, here it is. The status is green, so it's now tracking. Um, I can see my heads tracking in the... I'd actually kind of turn that... Uh, let's, let's put that back into full... So I can see my, my head tracking. I might put the... or might, might define the sweet spot. Eh, sorry, this is a little small, but that's fine. Um, I might uh, define the sweet spot. Um, so I'm, I'm looking right right ahead of me and click speed sweet spot. And okay, now I'm fine. So if I'm now playing a note, I have that in front of me. And as in the last video, you were hearing exactly what I'm hearing in my headphones. So if I'm turning my head to the right, you have the signal on the left. If I'm turning my head to the left, you have the signal on the right. Now, by the way, last time I said that the, uh, the um, ambisonics panner or the ambisonics signal, once the distance is encoded, the, uh, the NX tracking system cannot decode the distance of the signal. That's uh, just the nature of the ambisonics file format. However, um, as we see here, it's, it's, it's trying to figure out the distance of the signal and the way it really does that is by trying to understand what the signal uh, is really representing so for example if you have a particular signal that creates a certain reverb in a certain room then from that particular reverb you can deduct essentially how far that signal is away uh, so because we don't really have any real life signal that uh, that distance here is just something that the nx system comes up with but uh, if this would be a pure sign signal, we would, in the very same way in the, we had in the last tutorial, just see a dot here. But my, since this is a essentially a, 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 a saturated signal or distorted signal, essentially we see we see Nix is trying to identify certain distance. Okay, so if I now if I'm now moving the to the side, right? So I can. So, so it, and that's really it. <laughs> that's already it. So, so, so we are now we are set to go. Um, um, and we can start creating ambisonics. That's how easy it actually is in Reaper. So, I, I, I do think <laughs> that is not completely unfounded that people kind of constantly point out that Reaper is a good piece of software because most of the things that it do, especially when it gets to more complex um, uh, tasks, uh, are really easy to do in in Reaper. Now. Um, before I go into why you still wanna, might want to do that in something like Ableton, let me just add one more comment here. And that is, it's also particularly easy in Reaper to now uh, print or render that audio because everything is uh, that we just did is, uh, is done in Reaper itself, in the door itself. So all we really need to do is if you want to create the ambisonics, the final ambisonics audio, we need to just bounce it. Um, now, if you bounce it, just be sure that you uh, turn off the... Uh, the the uh, the decoding signal because you obviously don't want to have the decode the, the decoding uh, plugin because you obviously don't want to have that decoded. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, all you really need to do is if you render it, um, and I'm not going to do that here because I, I don't have any MIDI uh, on my track. But if you want to render, it, just make sure that you render all channels and. Now, if you if you click on the drop down, it only goes up to eight, but you can actually punch in sixty four here, 
uh, and that will then essentially render all 64 channels and if I have some media in there or kind of have all kinds of things mixed and uh, and, and um, once again have turned off the, the VST that does the decoding um, to make sure that I'm, I'm not kind of kind of changing the, the signal in a way that I don't want to. Uh, I cl simply click on render and it's going to bounce out a full seventh order ambisonics file. How beautiful is that? Now, let me go back to the uh, to the comment that I made about why you still might want to do that in a thing like Ableton. And there, there, are, there are really many of reasons and some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But um, most commonly, the, the most important one really is that all of us have a feel a certain connection, or most of us, let's put it that way. And most of us feel a certain connection with the digital audio workstation that has to do with the fact that's the one that we started kind of working with. It's, it's the one we learned uh, how to produce audio. It's, it's, it's the one that we spend a lot of time with. Uh, uh, and if you don't like what you're doing and if you don't like the software that you're using, then you're most likely not really be, uh, successful. So, so most of us have a certain emotional connection to a digital audio workstation, which sounds weird, but that's the way it really is, especially if you're not on a professional level. Right? So if you're, if you're somebody who is uh, working uh, for fun or uh, semi-professional and, and, uh, and, and really wants to enjoy what he or she is doing, then obviously, um, essentially, the, the door is important to you. So um, uh, that, with that also comes the, 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 uh, the, the reality that we are usually very good in one particular door, but, but not necessarily in another one. So switching from one door to the next is not necessarily something that we want to do. So, so if you are a passionate Ableton user, uh, it's, it's just important to understand that essentially you can do ambisonics in Ableton if you want to. Um, but if you never use the door, then certainly uh, there are other options that might be more useful for you. Now, there might other be other, other reasons why you want to do something in Ableton, and that has to do with the way Ableton really works. And um, for me personally, one of the things that was really appealing uh, in terms of Ableton is the session view and the clip launcher. So if you're doing some sort of real-time audio, um, some interactive active experiences where you want to mix things on the fly in live performances, then Ableton is certainly better suited for that because because you can launch clips in 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 ways. So it it is it has its advantages. Some people also say that. The uh, automation in Ableton is something they really enjoy. It's really straightforward. You, you, as soon as you click something, the red automation line pops up, and you just move things around. And because, in a uh, when we plan out uh, how three-dimensional signals move around the, sp the space. Uh, it will quite often be necessary to work a lot with automation. That can actually be an advantage. So, so there, are, there are reasons why you still might want to do something, thing, things like that in, in a software piece like, like Ableton, but it's certainly not the only one. Now, this is essentially as far as I want to take it today. Um, for the next couple of weeks, what I'm planning on doing is uh, turning my attention slightly away from Ableton to something that is starting to really pop up quite a bit, and that is Dolby Atmos. Um, I see a lot of professional studios converting, especially if they're working with surround sound, uh, converting their environment into a Dolby Atmos setup. And, uh, and Dolby Atmos and, a and Ambisonics have some relationship with each other. They are sort of both uh, immersive media formats. The main difference being that Dolby Atmos um, is more tied to a particular, let's put it that way, it's, it's more connected to a particular speaker setup. So it is in that sense a little bit more easy to understand what it actually is. But at the same time, what I found is that there's very little information about actually how to do that, how to work with Dolby Atmos. It's very technical usually. So I, uh, I'd like to spend a couple of videos on kind of explaining how to uh, produce in Dolby Atmos. And for that, we are going to move to a yet another door. Uh, we're going to move to uh, Nuendo. And uh, the nice thing about Nuendo is that they, it's actually the first door that has the full Dolby Atmos setup uh, included. And uh, that will allow us to use Dolby Atmos uh, in, um, in the box uh, in, in Ableton, monitoring uh, with, uh, with Waves and X. Uh, without any particular Dolby Atmos speaker setup. Uh, and that's something that needs a couple of videos. So that's what I want to do over the next couple of weeks. And uh, meanwhile, if you have any questions, drop me a note, uh, make a comment and do all the usual things that people do on YouTube. Uh, you know, kind of like, subscribe, whatever. And uh, see you next time.